Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. Now, I'm not typically the person who does the intros to these videos, and there's a good reason for that. Over a week ago, as we typically do, we recorded a Now episode, that is to say an episode of our Jams and Teen Now series, where we talk about the latest goings on in new music, new singles releases, new album releases that we're interested in, uh, interesting conversations, discourse, things like that related to current and recently released music. And also a discussion topic, which we've been doing in our Now episodes as well, where we talked about the most underrated albums of 2013. And you're going to get to see that Now episode in its totality, but because of how strenuous things have been editing wise for me lately and also because of trying to figure out ways to release our content in the most consumable way possible basically we've decided that from now on these two halves of our now episodes you know the half where we talk about new music music news singles songs etc and the half where we have a discussion topic like underrated albums or great songs on bad albums or those kinds of things we're going to release those as separate videos basically so what you're going to see today is the first half of our recording session where we talked about new music, we talked about great new EPs from Better Lovers and Yellow Card and Amberlynn, we talked about new singles from the Gaslight Anthem, we talked about Big Thief's Vampire Empire, which led to a huge conversation about indie rock stand culture, talked about a great new song from Code Orange, I talked at length about Al City's abominable new record, and Jake also reviewed the new Greta Gerwig film Barbie as well. So that's what you're going to get to see today. And then in our next video, which will probably either go up tomorrow or the day after, you'll get to see our conversation on the most underrated albums of 2013. So without further ado, let's get on with the video. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and D podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And we're coming at you with a brand new now episode. Feels like it's been centuries since we've done one of these, but here we are back again. Guess who's back? The three of us. And today we're going to be talking about everything going on in the world of music and movies to all that jazz. Fun stuff. We're not talking about all that jazz. I mean, we might, bitch. Absolutely. And first thing we want, I want to do today is I want to address the outcome of a recent video on this channel that you may have seen that went up that will have went up recently, which is the great annual music yeah, account, the fourth annual Jams and Tea music quiz, which we do around this time each year. And uh, well, I was going to say I won't spoil the result, but no, I am. I have to. That's the point. How it works. In case you didn't see how it ended, spoiler alert, Jake emerged the victor for the third time in a row. And as you may or may not know, the this to the victor go the spoils of getting to choose an a full artist discography that each of the rest of us, myself, Morgan, and August, get to listen to. Jake, why don't I throw over to you now to kind of set this up and, and, and introduce to us. Genuinely, we have no idea what we are going to be spending a significant portion of our year, I am sure, listening to. Genuine first reaction. <laughs> uh, well, to reprise what happened a little bit is that the, the, the race between the three of you ended up being quite close. And so I kind of conceded that it was like, I feel, and because I've won for the th third year in a row, I would feel kind of bad assigning any like legitimately bad discographies or even kind of like a longer mixed one like I did with Riley and Muse and August and Toby Mac last year. So I kind of generally just decided that it would be a good idea to pick mostly like to the best of my ability, a decently compact discography that is full of good stuff for everyone riley i'll start with you um it was the, yours was easily the most difficult uh one i had to pick because i've heard I everything didn't... baby well i mean that's the thing is that i was like you know i really want to give riley something that they largely haven't heard before just because i don't often get the chance to do that and because, you know, after Muse last year, it just kind of feels like old hat to make you listen to a bunch of albums that you've never heard of before again. So I was like, I need an ideal discography. I need something with not too many albums, but enough stuff you haven't heard, something that I really like. That's the, the main thing here is that all three of these bands are bands that I really, really love. So, Riley, you are getting the discography of Canadian post-hardcore band No Means No 
Uh, you can also include the album that they did with the frontman of the Dead Kennedys in that. I'm leaving that completely up to you as to whether or not you want to count that. But their discography is absolutely excellent, and I look forward to seeing what you have to say about them, because I don't believe you've heard anything from them. And it's over the course of, like, 40 years, and they have many different sounds, many different genres. Uh, Wrong is one of my favorite albums I've listened to this year, so hoping that you get to enjoy those okay i mean i'm 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 very pleased with that that's a i was hoping you would give me a discography that i had not heard anything from before and you have so that's this is this is exciting that that is the theme this week uh i wanted to go for things that were you know sizable things that i like and things that i know you all hadn't heard before uh morgan Yours is probably my favorite one that I'm recommending, completely unsurprising to anyone who's been paying attention to the channel, uh, but it does come with a bit of a stipulation because it's not an entire discography. It's really more of an essential era of a much bigger discography because I was like, I could give Morgan this discography, but there's a, there's like 14 albums in it and that feels like a little bit too many, frankly. So Morgan is getting the discography selectively, of Susumu Hirasawa, particularly Aurora through White Tiger Field, a.k.a. the amazing run of records that he has. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just need to do that. So, and yeah, frankly, I would have done it if his, if his music was on fucking streaming. Yeah, I've got, um, <laughs> I've got every single uh, album of his in a Google Drive, if that would be helpful. I can pass yes. that along to you. And, of course, we have August as well, who performed admirably. Um, very unsurprising pick here. Um, but considering August had a particular listen in the past two weeks where he was particularly fond of something that he didn't expect to be fond of, I figured that this was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. And this will be the second time I am using this uh, podcast quiz victory to recommend something regarding this band. But of course, with August, I am picking the discography of the Dillinger Escape Plan. He's already listened to Calculating the only thing Infinity, I know so about can just that kind of band skip that one. That the I, I don't really singers... like this. Particularly the Greg Pucciato album is what uh, we're talking about. Drinker. So, there you go. All right. Well, there we have it. So you will be able to follow and track the progress of us as we work our way through these discographies and subsequent now episodes throughout the year. So on the note of the Dillinger escape plan, though, it's time to talk about some new music. And it makes most sense, I think, for us to kick off with one of our most heavily anticipated releases of the year. I mean, I won't lie, we were maybe kind of hoping it would be an album, but we're certainly not ungrateful for the new EP from the hardcore supergroup Bitter Lovers. And if you don't know, this is a supergroup containing Greg Pucciato of the Dillinger Escape Plan, Jordan Buckley, Stephen Machichi, and Clayton Hollyoke of Every Time I Die, and Will Putney, the fast-becoming legendary metal producer from the band Fit for an Autopsy. It is an incredible lineup of immense talent, especially considering that Dillinger and Every Time I Die, great bands who we have extolled the virtues of many times on the show, are sadly no more. So it's really, really exciting to see some of the talent from those great bands be channeled into this new project. And so we had the release of the debut single from this project, 13 Under 30, earlier this year, which completely knocked our heads off. And now we finally have the full debut EP, which is titled God Made Me an Animal. I mean, where to begin? What do you guys think of this thing? It is rare in life that something so promising delivers completely. And here we are. They did it. Uh, the pedigree involved, like, naturally, it should be nothing less than this level of quality. And it still found ways to surprise and excite me, given the sky-high hopes that come from the standard at work here. The best thing I can say about it is that it both is and isn't what you would expect from uh, Dillinger and Every Time I Die Supergroup. It, it feels like genuinely like it is pushing at the boundaries of metalcore in a way that both of those bands had before but with this particular and distinct flavor 
Yeah. I say this like with all without meaning any kind of shade. I mean it entirely positively, but it's kind of like the ultimate fan service super group in a certain sense. Because when oh, I listen yeah. to it, it's it, it's it is just Dillinger and every time I die at the same time. It's like it, the the sounds of those two bands are so beautifully infused. And of course, the end product of that, while being a synthesis of those two bands, where you're like, I can recognize this band and I can recognize that band, does ultimately become its own animal, no pun intended. And so, yeah, it's really, really exciting. It's really, really immediately satisfying because you go to it with this expectation that, okay, it's these guys from these bands doing this new thing together and and sometimes supergroups will make a point not to do that sometimes supergroups will make a point to deliberately differentiate themselves from their previous work and kind of carve out something entirely new but what's so just immensely immediate and rewarding about better lovers is how well they channel the the feeling you get that kind of catharsis that raw intensity you get from those two bands through the talents of the the men in these bands and what they're good at doing and just gives you something that makes you feel like okay i had a dillinger and every time i die sized hole in my life that is now completely filled and all i need is more let me just say i i love this uh this better lovers ep now uh, before this, I hadn't really been much into Every Time I Die or, or Dillinger Escape Plan. And apparently I've been listening to the wrong Dillinger Escape Plan album because I, I thought Greg Pucciato was on uh, Calculating Infinity, but he is not. Uh, but he, he's really a highlight here, and, and I want to talk about his vocal performance just a bit because I think it's really great. Like, just his screaming, so good. I, I remember Jake in in our like group chat. You were talking about uh, how how there's this like lock in your brain that prevents you from just screaming as loud as possible, except when you're in mortal danger. And how he's he's broken that lock, but you know breaking that lock is one thing. Mastering breaking it is another. Because uh, just last night I was out with some friends you know, hanging out in the forest, so I decided, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna try screaming as loud as possible. And I did that, you know, two, three, well, realistically five times, and by the end of it, my throat was shot and I had to whisper for the next two hours. Yeah, the best endorsement I can give of this is that when 30 Under 13 came out, we were all collectively like, yeah, this is one of the best songs of the year, and now I'm not even sure it's the best song on this EP. Frankly, I think the title track is one of my favorite things that any person involved in Dillinger or Every Time I Die has ever done. I love that kind of like the little southern rock riff that starts out God Made Me an Animal. That shit is tasty. And, you know, it is kind of weird adjusting to like not hearing Keith Buckley, but hearing Every Time I Die and not hearing Ben Weinman, but also hearing Greg Pucciato. Like, it's a it's a weird kind of cognitive dissonance that you hear at it, first. It's like, but, it's like the sort of logical next step for both acts is happening on the same project. It feels like this was some sort of cosmic convergence that happened, just because, you know, it is it is really a shame the way that Every Time I Die kind of ended, especially on such a high point. Like, we were all, like, really enthusiastic about their last album, Radical. It's easy to forget that they've been one of the most consistently great hardcore bands for, like, the last 20 years, which is, I mean, like, they have an impressive array of records. And the cool thing about them is that they never, like, they, they don't really have a weak release, honestly. And this keeps up that pedigree, but it also doesn't sound just like another Every Time I Die thing. It'll fill that hole, like Riley said, but it is distinctly something new. I also think the writing on here for all of these songs is super duper sharp. Um, Become So Small has this vocal delivery that, I mean, dead ringer for what uh, somebody like Mike Patton was doing on the Irony is a Dead Scene EP, the Become So Small, Become So Small, Become So Small. I fucking <laughs> heroin. I love that shit. This is, this is an easy highlight of the year. Like, I've listened to this EP almost every single day since it's dropped. What really gets me about it is that, you know, um, obviously every time I die, we're, we're a fantastic and heavy and, and gnarly metalcore band, but they they never, I don't think they ever really had, at least not in my experience, again, I haven't heard all of their records, um, I only have a sample of their later stuff, but they're like, there's a, 
a zaniness, a kind of unpredictable violence, a kind of like animalistic quality to Dillinger and Greg's presence in that band in particular that is so much more i guess deranged and kind of terrifying than anything i've heard from every time i die which is not a diss it's just a point of difference and so what's really really oh, interesting yeah. about this project is the way that because you have greg fronting it and doing the vocals he's going to bring that energy that kind of you know off the wall insanity to it and what's great about it is it's not just greg doing greg over every time i die because the band absolutely push themselves to match the place that he is at you really get the sense that these musicians who've come from different places you know greg versus you know everyone who came from every time i die plus of course will putney who really is the secret source here they're all pushing each other and they're all kind of getting each person outside of their comfort zone and that's what elevates and gives an extra edge to it i think on the note of long-standing artists that all of us have some affinity for releasing EPs, both Anne Berlin and Yellow Card have released EPs in the past couple weeks. I'll start with Anne Berlin first. I wasn't that crazy about their last EP, and I'm I'm not that crazy about this one. With the exception of the final track, uh, Nothing More, uh, which is a near eight minute long synthwave jam that features a, a saxophone jam section at the end. And it's both something I would not expect out of this band, but also completely makes sense to me. There's a lot of that really heavy electronic synth influence all over uh, Vital and Lowborn both. And this feels like the first time that they're carrying on that influence and expanding in a way that is, you know, interesting. Like, you know, I would be perfectly okay if this band were to get rid of guitars altogether because uh, most of the time that they're making a rock song on this on these last two EPs, I've been kind of, I don't know. Uh, eh. A lot of that has to do with the production, uh, which I think is like just as marred in sort of an electronic influence as the actual synthwave flavored stuff, but it just doesn't fit. Yellow card, I have much more positive things to say about. I think this is a really strong uh, return to form. I mean, it's it's a yellow card EP. They're not doing anything you haven't heard yellow card do before, uh, but it feels like the natural progression from the self-titled album uh, to now in terms of just sort of maturation and general outlook, where they still maintain as much youthful spirit and a uh, nostalgic outlook as they always have without falling into the trap that so many pop punk bands fall into once they start hitting the, you know, their, their thirties and forties, where it just sounds like they're recycling the same attitude that they had when they were 23. There's a pierce the veil and a dashboard confessional feature. Yes. Wow. The latter makes perfect sense to me. The former was like, mm -hmm. oh, all right. I really like the presence of both. Yeah, definitely a really solid outing. And I look forward to what they these these guys do next. On the note of um Morgan Core, I guess, but I suppose to be a bit more broad, you know, kind of a, a real American shit. Uh we have to talk about the new Where upcoming record from one band you might have heard of called the gaslight anthem i believe this is going to be their first record and i want to say nine nine years, years. Yeah. yeah it's called history books and the day we record this i believe we have the second single for the album having come out the title track of the record as well which has a feature from one mr bruce springsteen and getting bruce springsteen on a gaslight anthem song is it <sighs> what's it's like getting... it's like when the killers did a song with bruce springsteen it's like it's like if brian wilson came on a animal collective song you know what i mean it's like that's kind of what this is it's like oh okay we're, we're just going there we're just kind of pulling it together like that uh what do you guys think of this sort of the the recent singles for this and the the potential for this new gaslight anthem album i love both of these songs but both come with a significant asterisks in that they kind of both sound like shit. And Peter it's, Cadis, it's, man, what are you doing? It's and it's not even like a, a Menzinger's Hello Exile way where it's like 
oh, this just has too much reverb on everything. This is like just a fundamental error in mixing. It sounds like on both of these songs, uh, the new single, History Books especially, I think it's particularly egregious when the guitar solo comes in and it's like this yeah. blaring, unpleasant tone that I think could sound nice, but it's just like so loud in the mix. You can um, barely hear Brian's vocals over the guitars on here. I mean, to quote was, myself in the past, I can't hear you. That was the thing that stood out the most to me was how quiet the vocals were, especially considering how, you know, a, a big anthemic vocal is kind of maybe the most important thing about a song like this, especially when you're billing it on a Bruce Springsteen feature. And look, I think that um, Brian and Bruce both sound great. It's just yeah, their... Bruce especially sounds amazing on this song. Okay. O honestly, I don't think I have as big of an issue with the way this sounds as you two do. Perhaps that's just my fandom of the Gaslight Anthem being a little bit more sort of casual than yours but yeah i guess it's a little bit like what people say about um actually it's not like this at all but i'm gonna make this comparison anyway it's a little bit like what people say about sister cities by the wonder years which has a different mixing issue where it's kind of really kind of compressed and harsh sounding in a way that people don't really vibe with i that that never really affected me all that much while listening to it but it is something that i do notice and i'm like oh, okay yeah i could see how this could reach a higher level if, if if a slightly different approach was taken and i think that's kind of how i feel about these two songs as well you know and also to a certain extent and again i'm not trying to make a one-to-one -one comparison here because i realize they're different bands but i couldn't help but think a little bit of uh you know that more recent killers material like a pressure machine things like that and and that is a weird sort of standard that i maybe unfairly held it to i was like you know these are good sort of heartland rock songs but i kind of want a little something more from them but yeah i i want to be really optimistic because it's you know first gaslight anthem record in nine years i want to be i want to i hope that it it really lands for me and i'm going to use the rollout as an excuse to listen to all the records i haven't heard but yeah it seems like what you've been saying has been shared a little bit by the community more broadly so um yeah it's a bit and, uh, and to be perfectly clear i've listened to both of these uh positive charge probably 30 times and uh this new one i, I just had it on repeat since i heard it uh this morning it hasn't stopped me, um, and it won't stop me when the album comes out because the songs are so good, but it's also just, like, confusing. And it's like, I don't know how you couldn't hear... Because it sounds unfinished. It sounds like an unfinished mix to me, and not... Uh, although it's, like, clearly a choice for some reason, it just sounds very much like they, somebody shipped an early version. And, you know... I will get over it if every song is as good as these two. So it's, it's it, it, again, just an asterisk mostly that's mm. unfortunately kind of had to dominate discussion around these two songs. But there's also, in terms of just like a controversial response from fans, I want to talk about this new single from Big Thief. It's called Vampire Empire. If you're a Big Thief fan, uh, it's likely that you were aware of the song before it even released because the song has been a staple of their live shows throughout the last tour they did when I saw them in December and got a lot of footage of the concert and talked about it in a video on this channel. I included a recording of them playing the song, which was one of the clear highlights of the night. It was just transfixing. It was emotionally devastating. It was a song that basically got the crowd onto their feet even as I'm sure many of us had never heard it before. It was my first time hearing it. And so there was a lot of anticipation for what is this song? When is the song going to come out? Is it going to be on their next album? We want to have an official version of it. This sort of reached fever pitch when they performed the song on Stephen Colbert's show a few months ago. And that became, by Big Thief standards anyway, kind of a viral thing that um, mm -hmm. you know, music journalists and fans and that sort of stuff kind of obsessed over. Anyway, we officially got the studio recorded version of Vampire Empire uh, uh, last week and fans were divided. Here's what I found really, really interesting. There's a few things I found really interesting about the response to this. People who were casual Big Thief listeners who weren't like listening to all the live performances and, you know, kind of inhaling everything as it came, generally speaking, liked to love the song. Uh, it, it's a, it's a 
classic Big Thief song. It has an incredibly emotional vocal performance from Adrienne, who towards the, towards the end of the song as well, kind of just starts to lose control a little bit in a way that she seldom does on record. It has this dynamic intensity to it where the verses are kind of sort of scrappy and paired back and sort of distant. And then when the chorus comes in, it's crunching and loud and brutal. Um, there is an aspect to the way that it's mixed and produced that is deliberately very rough around the edges. And I think that works well because the subject matter of the song is a kind of emotionally difficult thing. It's a song about getting lost inside your obsession and devotion toward your partner to the point where it starts to kind of drain you and starts to kind of put you against them and resent their needs and wants it's a really intense song and i've listened to it maybe 30 times since it came out the official version of it but fans were divided I, what, what i found interesting about it is that there are two reasons why fans were divided and and i can kind of understand both of them because i've been in that position before one is that the official version is shorter and has certain omissions compared to the live versions particularly the one on colbert there's certain lyrics that are taken out there's a guitar solo that's in the live version there's a flute solo that's in the live version both of which don't appear in the studio version of the song um and i can understand missing those things although i never allow myself to get super attached to them um and the other thing is that people really, really didn't like the way this is produced and mixed. And I can understand that to a certain extent as well. It is, again, like I said, it's rough around the edges. But I think if you really engage with what the song is doing and you engage with what the song is about and you engage with the feeling of the song, that makes sense. Now, that's not to denigrate anyone who still finds it a difficult listen, but I'm, I'm, I'm all over this, man. I'm completely into it. I think it's an incredible single. It is actually a double A side single, but they've only released the first song. Uh, the second song is going to come out when the physical release of the single drops in a couple of months' time, I think. Incidentally, very cool to be to be releasing a double A side single like this in this way through physical media outside of just record store day. That feels like a very big thief thing to do. Uh, no idea whether this will actually make it onto the next record if they've even started recording their next record kind of hard to say but yeah i just wanted to put a shout out there for it and ask your listeners at home as well what do you think of this song it's divided fans a little bit are you closer to me or are you do you have your reservations how do you think it compares to the live version but i really want to see big thief pursue this more aggressive and edgy and kind of brittle sound i think because it would make for an interesting uh pivot away from the gradual refinement of their more recent material i mean i know that dragon new war mountain had all had beautiful you know luxurious and, and immaculately produced stuff and it had really rough and edgy and 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 you know more unkempt material as well and, and the beauty of that record was the way that it kind of encircled all of those things together but i would love to see them pursue that direction of the of you know the kind of like love 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 sort of songs that this i think fits in with uh really nicely so yeah we'll see it was uh curious to see the response as a bit of an outsider just because you mentioned that like i am a more casual big fee fan even though i like more or less adore everything i've heard from the band and adrian but like it, it raises an interesting question about the ownership that fans feel over artists like there was a uh i think it was like a some sort of tiktok that went viral or something but it was just like this very incensed person shall we say uh talking about how you know once art is out there it belongs to the consumers and they were using that logic to kind of say that like oh well that means like you can't change the lyrics or you can't change the instrumental parts of like the live version of the song and i just i think it's First of all, I think it's just kind of there's a lack of respect for the artist that's just there that feels very possessive and strange. And I also think that it really accounts for very little more than recency bias, because like to me, a an extended version of a song and a live performance, like adding instrumental bits, adding different lyrics, changing things up a little bit. That's just what live performances are. Like we're fans of a band like The National who are like known for doing this. Like a song like Walk It Back off of Sleep Well Beast sounds really, really like 
small and minimal on the record compared to how fucking enormous it sounds in the live version. That's kind of the novelty of it. It's like we felt like a theme with the newest record as well that we kind of touched. Yeah, we live in a time where the immediacy and the vitality of the music scene and live performances, that sort of visceral experience of getting to see a band live you want the band to deliver something that you're going, you know, is really going to like affect you and you're going to, you're going to see it. And it's just going to, it's a different experience than when you listen to something on the album. So I value big thief, you know, definitely kind of planting their flag in the ground and just being like, this is the studio version. This is the live version. Both versions exist. You all have both to listen to. We understand that you all have a preference. Their response to this sort of fan backlash, I think was very measured. uh, And I appreciate that of them, but I think we're kind of beginning to see this phenomenon in specifically kind of that nebulous indie music circle where like we're beginning to see the, for lack of a better term, the boy geniusification of Big Thief, where, you know, they're getting so big and getting outside their initial audience that these kinds of reactions are becoming a little bit more regular and a little bit more unreasonable. <laughs> well, it's the logical extension of stand culture, right? Because stand culture yes. has, has burbled up over the last 10 years with regard to kind of mainstream pop artists. And as trends in, in popular music have shifted towards the world of it, well, it's not, it's like the world of indie rock and the world of popular music have kind of like slowly moved toward each other and started kind of converging. And so you're seeing stand culture that you would originally, or you would, you know, in the olden days of you know 2015 or whatever you would more associate with those huge big name pop and hip-hop artists you're starting to see that kind of blend into indie rock as indie rock becomes mainstream and so yeah what's interesting about what well, another thing another thing that's interesting about this big thief thing is that like you know i saw that i think it was an instagram post um you know that went mildly viral with this kind of heavily incensed yeah. fan, making these very you know intense points about how you know we buy the tickets to your shows and we buy the merch and we pay for you to make this music so therefore we are owed you know a certain level of of uh, consistency such a deeply cynical take well it was like it, it was funny because it was like to me it was like you are approaching this band you love and you're treating them like your landlord. You know what I mean? You're treating them like, yeah, yeah I, pay, I pay you this money. Da, 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 do this to me. It's interesting how, you know, the, the, the online phenomenon of parasocial relationships is kind of mutating, you know, over time into something that's so much more fierce and so much more ugly and so much more violent. And I think that as measured as Big Thief's response were, you could tell they were really pissed off about it as well. I mean, for them to even address oh, it, yeah in the first place shows you how much harassment that they were getting online from from fans or from people who were you know really really upset with this new version and so you know and they made the point that each time they play a song whether that is being recorded or not differently that yeah the song means something different at every single time it's played by virtue of its context when it is played and so a, a, a studio recording a you know a released recording is not from their perspective the official version of the song it never is intended to be and that's not the way that it should be approached it is just a version of the song that represents what the song was to them at that moment in time when they recorded it and released it and that's an interesting approach to how we even think about records and you know officially released versions of music especially when we live in a time where you know live recordings and all that kind of thing is are more easy to access than ever which is the point they make in their response Mm. as well i mean bootleg culture has been around for a really really long time it used to be this thing that was specifically the 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 um dominion of you know like super obsessive nerdy um prog fans and stuff who would like you know bob dylan fans all that kind of thing he would obsessively collect as many of these different recordings as possible but now because of youtube and because of everything you can hear a song Um, potentially long in advance of it being officially released as a studio recording. So that has, um, that has, I think, interacted here with this bizarre and unhealthy trend in parasocial relationships between with music fans in an interesting way in a sad way, but in a way I I think we can probably expect to see more of. It all feeds back into that thing that we keep talking about on here where we're talking about like, the ubiquitousness of streaming making everything feel all the more impermanent so basically whenever an artist takes an extra step 
to sort of emphasize the ephemeral nature of music and art, I'm always going to be on board with that because they like just the fact that this was made a story is kind of nice just because I feel like it emphasizes the the differences between the two versions and it allows you to appreciate it more. It's it's a very, very strange phenomenon that like would not have happened if they had released the studio version first. Because of how album rollouts happen, right? Artists usually don't play new material live before it's released. No. And this is also another it's one of the reasons It's not as commercially why, like viable anymore. But another one of the reasons why is because people and fans will develop a relationship with it that then is going to kind of, you know, set up an expectation that you don't want to exist. You want records to be taken when they're released, you know, as free of external context for these songs as possible. So, but, you know, it, it's sad when a band are so passionate and enthusiastic about a song that they've made that they want to start playing it at shows before they've officially released a studio version. And, and you know, it, it, that that's a privilege, right? It's a privilege to get to witness yeah. that. You're really lucky and it feels really awesome when you go to a show and they play new material that they haven't released yet and you get to experience that. That's one of the coolest things in the world. And so to kind of abuse that, you know, abuse that privilege is so, you know, mind boggling to me. I just find it funny that a portion of this band's fan base wants to claim some kind of ownership when they most likely exclusively stream them on Spotify. <laughs> and like, even if you do buy the merch, your, your, your $40 for a shirt and a vinyl record does not entitle you to anything, but specifically within the venue of like a, a service that will pay an artist a royalty of like a 30 cent check at a time. I don't think you live in the real world. Like your I your money entitles you, you to what you're purchasing. Like we pay the money with the tickets and for merch. It's like yeah, and you get tickets and merch. Get tickets yeah. to the show that we play. Not not you. You don't play the show. <laughs> Moving swiftly along, I want to talk about one of the most baller new songs that came out in the last week in my opinion sort of came from nowhere wow. as well wasn't really expecting it haven't really given this band much time before and it's not because i have anything against them it's just because i just happen to have never really uh indulged but we have a new album on the way from the industrial metalcore legends code orange uh called the above and last week we had the release of the single take shape uh, featuring one Mr. William Patrick Corgan. Uh, and let me uh, be clear here, really? rumors of Billy Corgan's contributions have been greatly exaggerated, but he's <laughs> on um, and It is straight up. It is a straight up slice of like 2003 era new metal. There's like a little bit of Linkin Park in the choruses. There's a little bit of Nine Inch Nails industrial in the verses. It is all West Borland esque guitar work. It, it fucking rules. All right. I, I fucking it does. This song. It's hard it's as shit. Slam. And Billy Corgan's feature on the bridge. Great. Come off. Like, come this is fantastic. This is the exact kind of uh, this is the exact kind of context I want Billy Corgan to be in. It is in, in other yes. bands' music contributing ethereal vocals that take me right back to 1995. Nothing. Mm -hmm. else. All right. That that that, that is exactly his. I what I want him to do is I want him to take on. I want him to really imbue this elder statesman status and stop making music, but just start showing up on other people's shit. Yeah. I think that would be baller as hell. But anyway, Corgan instead aside, of complaining about not being mentioned in a book with My Chemical Romance, Corgan aside, killer song, killer song. I mean, Morgan, you're the most, um, you're the Code Orange fan with the most kind of, you know, with the most hours put in. I guess I'd say. What are your thoughts on this? Honestly, I haven't heard a Code Orange album in full. Just like everything I have heard from them, whoops ass. I liked all the singles from the last album. I like everything I've heard on this this uh, coming album. Um, I really should just power through all of their releases and tell them why I haven't. I listened um, to Forever this week, and I think that's an album that basically everybody in the podcast would enjoy to some extent. It's yeah, fucking like, wild. Uh, Bleeding in the Blur was one of my most listened to tracks that year. Um, Best song on the album. The, the title track is like, God. fucking Christ. Uh, a band known for their absolutely spine-cracking live shows. Yeah, I, I love that they're going in this direction. I love this song. 
former guest of the podcast, uh, Coffee and I were actually talking about Code Orange this week because he's going to go see them play alongside uh, another 2020s heavy hitter so far, which is Model Actress. Oh, yeah. I cannot, God, what, like, a, that, what a fucking perfect combination. I was like, L- listen, you're going to die in that pit. Like, <laughs> like, There's no way you're making it out of there. Like, I'm so jealous. That sounds like such an amazing fucking show. Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, look. I have gone from being a code orange, you know, someone who, again, like, like you guys sort of enthusiastic about the little that I've heard to now I'm like, I've got to get back into this back catalog. I've got to listen to forever. I've got to listen to underneath, which has been in my iTunes library since yeah. the week it came out. I still haven't heard it. Yeah. I need to um, listen to underneath. So yeah, but, but yeah, this song is amazing. Like this is when we talk about kind of like new metal revival, this is the kind of thing I mean. It's like perfectly Mm -hmm. the spirit and sound of, of 2003 or like the early 2000s in general, but making it sound like it's happening right now. And oh yeah, I just, um, I'm completely on board for it. Uh, And look, if Billy Corgan himself insists on continuing to make music, he could do worse than heading in a new metal direction. I'm Listen, just, uh, the the best moments on that Adam project were when he leaned so far into either incredibly tasteless arena rock and like semi new metal adjacent shit. So if he's going to keep making music, please let it be that kind of shit. Just because I don't I don't mind listening to you do that, Billy. You're good at it. Why have you stopped doing it? I want to talk about an album now from that came out this year can we do that well look the reason i i'm a bit hesitant about it because we we can we like to talk about recent releases in this format that we don't necessarily have enough thoughts on for a kind of full committed review um Mm. but also sometimes we just miss things and we need a while to catch up on them and sometimes we're like oh this came out like earlier this year and it's kind of had its moment and it's gone by now and so it's like you know the 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 statute of limitations on, you know, being current with it has, has completely gone. So, you know, it's a little bit of a missed opportunity and the album I want to talk about came out in March. So it's like, okay, there's been a little bit of time since this and, you know, maybe we're not striking while the iron's hot, but um, to be fair, it came with a thud because it's a terrible album. One of the worst of oh. the year, from one of the worst scourge of the earth bands of the last 15 years, that being Owl City. That's right, baby. Oh. We're back with Owl City of Fireflies and Good Time. Disgusting. Uh, they released a new album in March. The new album is called Coco Moon. It is the seventh album from Owl City. In case you may be not familiar, Owl City, of course, had gained fame with their smash hit number one single Fireflies in 2009. Uh, that was from their second album, and they have continued to persist ever since. Our City is the solo project of one Mr. Adam Young, who, you know, it's also worth noting, you know, I did a little bit of research. I wasn't aware of this. Did you guys know that in 2016, Adam Young released 11 concept albums? Nice. There was one every single month, I think. Well, obviously, barring one month, given that there's only 11. But he had 11 orchestral concept albums based around historical events or significant uh, pieces of of world history. You know, there was Apollo 11, RMS Titanic, The Ascent of Everest, Omaha Beach. Who wants to hear Adam Young's Omaha Beach concept album? (laughs) And the list went on. Stop. I bring this up only to emphasize that Adam Young is an incredibly prolific musician, and Al City are a fairly prolific band. They have, as I said, continued to persist, continued to put out music. And why this is relevant is that you would, you would not know, really, that any time had passed when listening to this new album from Al City, Coco Moon. If you only knew Al City from Fireflies and maybe that one terrible Carly Rae Jepsen song, then you would, and you listen to this, you would assume this could very be the follow up to that album but no there have been four our city albums in between the album with fireflies on it and this one they're just a band that found that niche so quickly ripping off the postal service and have just kind of sunken into it so deeply just kind of entrenched their claws in that space 
that they see no need to abandon it. And, you know, on some level, I respect a certain level of commitment to knowing your niche, right? So I'm sure that there are people out there who love our city. I'm sure that they're probably all... I'm not. I'm sure they're probably all just as, if not more, fundamentally Christian than Adam Young is. And they're probably (laughs) in their late 20s, I would say. And they're probably saving themselves for marriage. And they probably have at some point owned a chastity belt. And they... I was going to say purity ring. Or a purity ring, yeah. You know, I think I I went to... That's a band. I boarded, uh, in my first year of university, I boarded with... um, a bunch of people, but one of them was this girl who was very, very heavily religious. I boarded with Owl City. Well, no, this girl really liked Owl City, and she was, you know, she's basically, I'm basing this cliche of the Owl City listener, particularly on her, and that's a a person who I have a lot of endearment for, but also at the same time, I wouldn't want to be alone in a room with them. And so here we have (laughs) this album from Owl City called Coco Moon, and I, like, I bring it up because I listened to it for one, but also because it is uniquely terrible in ways that surprised even me. Like what I was expecting was some, you know, you know, weepy, joyful, little bloopy bloopy, uh, I love you sort of songs. I was expecting something that, you know, I was expecting like a, a that that kind of parody of of Ben Gibbard, you know, when, you know, during the era where he was married to Zoe Deschanel sort of thing. I was expecting that kind of thing to come through. What I wasn't expecting was a song that retells the entire plot of the movie Castaway from the perspective of the volleyball. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. No, it's not. When I say that, I'm not exaggerating. There is a song on this record called Kelly Time that tells the entire plot of Castaway, spoilers and all, from the perspective of the volleyball. Now, if you've, whether or not you've seen Castaway, uh, you may or may not know that at a certain key point in the narrative of that film, uh, Tom Hanks's central protagonist and the volleyball he named Wilson are separated. You know, and it's a very emotional moment in Robert Zemeckis masterpiece, right? And so you might think, well, hang on. How is the volleyball going to tell the entire plot of Castaway if at a central point halfway through the film, the volleyball exits the core narrative? Great question, I would say. You know, really great question. I was very curious when I picked up on what was happening that how Adam Young would approach it. And and by the way, I had plenty of time to think about this as well because almost every song on this record is five or six minutes long. You know, we're, oh, we're, God. About, we're really talking about Adam Young is taking his time to build worlds on this album so i'm getting into this songs are so long that adam young has become adam old (laughs) so so once i kind of clued into what was happening i was like okay i'm very curious how this is going to pan out and so the the kind of core of the song is the volleyball which is obviously sentient in this interpretation of the story naturally observing i mean the main character needs to have agency this is creative writing one-on-one exactly observing the heartache that Tom Young's FedEx delivery person has gone through the separation from his who's who plays the the woman in that movie is that like Helen Hunt or something I can't remember. That anyway, sounds, right? It's been a long time since I've seen Castaway. Anyway, so he's the the volleyball is observing this sort of you know underlying emotional heartache that he's going through, and then once they're separated, cheers him on to get the girl back. You know, choruses that go, ooh, 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 I'm ready for anything. Ooh, 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 who knows what the tide could bring. Out there on that lonely ocean, we met a passing humpback whale, because all the way from Bakersfield, the tide gave us a sail. And just like that, it happened. The waves took me away. And I'm sorry, I'm so sorry that you lost a friend <laughs> that day. And it really goes on and on and on with this shit. That's not even close to the worst song on this, by the way. That of one's it's not. funny and interesting because of the novelty of that concept the song under the circus lights maybe takes the cake here actually no there is a there's a clear worst song that i'll get to but the song under the circus lights is up there it is a love story to a trapeze artist i saw her up there on the ropes or whatever sort of thing where adam young is a child in this song and is basically discovering love or discovering that the capacity for having feelings for another human being in that way for the first time during this magical trip to the circus with his family 
and you have lines like once upon a summer a traveling circus came to town from the land down under and i was filled with wonder when i saw the girl on the flying trapeze tear through the air with the greatest of ease i got cotton candy and then in a daze i met her gaze and she winked right at me and my heart pounded madly when i saw the girl on the flying trapeze capture the crowd with the greatest of ease she was a light and a dark lullaby that girl was raised by a butterfly i swear when i caught her eye I could almost fly and under the circus lights i must have fallen in love that night sorry i just is this still from the perspective of the the ball this is a different song morgan this is the this is a different song i thought i thought that was what the album was about no 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 there's just one song song. there's one cast it's only one piece of this magnificent tapestry morgan i wish the whole album was a castaway concept record that would be incredible Oh, so grand and graceful, confetti rained as she climbed through the air like a homesick angel. Quote, she makes heartache painful. Adam. What? My brother in. What is heartache? How does she make it painful if by its very definition, it is a state of aching? How does that work, Adam? Explain it to me. I would just like to point out that in effort to mine this for comedic potential, I checked to see, wouldn't it be funny if there was an Owl City subreddit? And there isn't. But I did find a 10-year-old post that compiles a bunch of old tweets from the Owl City official Twitter account. And it is the most 13-year-old girl on Tumblr shit I have ever seen in my life. And also, Adam Young looks almost exactly like Corey feldman like it's alarming honestly there's there there's i mean the kind of peter pan energy to him you know he's got tweets gems such as swag mode activated (laughs) regularly regularly uses the word derp and like i need you all to understand half of these tweets are him tweeting abbreviated conversations like grandma so do you have a gf me lol no grandma that's pathetic what are you doing with your life me derp grandma bye that's a real tweet that's a real tweet i just read let let him cook all right (laughs) hold up he might be honest look I am just the right level of distance and, you know, painfully nostalgic for that era of my life that I'm willing to embrace, like, you know, TFW, no GF and Spooderman, oh, Gooby, please me. If he, if he wants to bring those back, then, then I say go for it. I've never seen someone who looks more like their music in my life. The gems continue on this album, by the way, with the song Vitamin C which is, of course, spelled like the ocean, but has one of the worst puns I've ever heard in my life. When I walk on the beach, I never want to leave because when I get kind of salty, I need some vitamin C. Uh... A curious wrinkle of this album is that it actually has some songs on it that aren't like halfway bad. I think that the, t- the Tornado and uh, Sons of Thunder, you know, there's moments where you get a sense of the kind of ambition that someone who would have made, you know, 11 concept albums in 2016 about various historical events might bring to their music, but it is simply not enough to overcome songs like the incredible Dinosaur Park, which whatever you think this is about, you're right i mean jurassic park at home question mark (laughs) dinosaur park is what happens when someone whose faith i'm assuming probably precludes the existence of dinosaurs but yet still (laughs) has some level of attachment to the concept and jurassic park is so good i wish dinosaurs were real (laughs) and so you have this song dinosaur park which already from its title is like it's like, it's like, how can I evoke Jurassic Park without saying, oh yeah, I'll just call it Dinosaur Park. But with that inimitable chorus refrain of, so I make believe with all of my heart that there's magic afoot unseen in the dark in Dinosaur Park. 
the moment that convinced me that Adam Young was legitimately just an eight-year-old boy forever trapped in a growing body is the part where he's like, what do dinosaurs talk about when they're alone? <laughs> he literally says, he literally is does the that. Hat in the lyrics? Yeah, he says, <laughs> this dude is so stoned. And, and all of this, all of this is built up to the worst song, to the, one of the most thunderingly, embarrassingly, hilariously terrible songs I have heard all year, which is the penultimate track on this record, The Meadow Lark. And <laughs> you are not prepared for this. So we've had all of these sort of sorts of wondrous songs about, you know, wishing dinosaurs were real and how cool is the beach. And I love the circus and isn't cast away a great film. You know, Robert Zemeckis is the one true auteur. You know, you've had all of that throughout this. And then you get a song like the Meadowlark. You know, you had allusions to Adam Young's Christianity and certain songs on this record as well, references to God and faith and that kind of thing, as if it weren't blindingly obvious that this man is. Is he a Mormon? I don't he know. Sounds like he could be. He could be. Uh... But then you get the song, The Meadowlark. And I'm just going to actually walk you through the song so you can experience what I went through in real time as I realized what the song was doing. And then as I followed its progression. Upon a winding forest road, I met a soldier far from home. I saw he was my enemy. So I aimed at him and he at me. Prepared was I but loathed to shoot, and he uncertain what to do. A cold sweat formed upon my brow, but we both kept rank and stood our ground. And then the most curious thing occurred. On wings arrived a tiny bird, and troubled not by war or peace, she sang for us a melody. Various oohs happen at this point in the song. I dared not move or look away, lest my life my foe would take. Let a Yoda speak in this. Yet in his eyes, <laughs> I saw his fright, just a boy like me, afraid to die. <laughs> you know, Lark sang on and on. Then more arrived and joined the song. And as I held my rival's stare, a tremendous chorus filled the air. Then in my heart, as clear as day, I heard a gentle whisper say, My son, if my disciple be, show grace and love your enemy. That's right. This is a song about two soldiers on opposing sides confronting each other, being struck by the song of a meadowlark, and then realizing that the meadowlark is the embodiment of Christ himself. With swell of birdsong all around, lowered I my rifle down, and as my foe took aim at me, I showed him yield on bended knee. He faltered then and shook with fear, and from his eyes he wiped it's a, a euphemism tear. for head. His gaze was as a brother's bond, and then he turned and he was gone. If I should live to see more days, I pray the Lord to guide my ways, with grace to love my enemy, for grace my Savior showed to me. Truly the imagine of the 21st century. Before we get into our final discussion topic today, I want to throw over to Jake to talk a little bit about one of the big media events of the year. That being the new film from Miss Greta Gerwig, Barbie. Uh, if you want to hear myself and Morgan talk about the other big event of the week, Oppenheimer, we're going to be on the First Watch podcast, either in an episode that may have already released or may not have, depending on when this, when this goes up. But I have not seen Barbie yet. I do intend to, um, but I want to hear from you, Jake, a little bit about how you feel the movie holds up. Well, uh, should be acknowledged, I am a big fan of Miss Greta Gerwig. Uh, she notably is the director of my favorite film, uh, 2019's Little Women. Um, and I also love Lady Bird. Uh, the script for Barbie was also co-written, has a writer credit from her husband, Noah Baumbach, uh, who we kind of mentioned in our favorite movies of last year video because he made White Noise last right. year, which Riley talked about. Um, real uh, cinematic power couple there. Like th those are that that's an impressive amalgamate of talent. Um, but, you know, Barbie is everywhere. The marketing has, you know, saturated the entire world with with Barbie stuff. 
uh, the press tour for it. We've been hearing strange Ryan Gosling quotes for months now. Uh, I'm still not sure half of them are real, but he is an unknowable man who I will not claim to know the mind of. Look, all um, I know but, is that apparently I have Ken in me. Uh, you know? I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if I want Ken. There's a little bit of Ken in all of us. Let it be said, I had my expectations decently tampered just because, you know, I'm very well aware of the fact that this is certainly a uh, one for them kind of movie from Greta, shall we say, just because, you know, obviously she came from the sort of indie scene with movies like Francis Ha and Lady Bird, uh, sort of that burgeoning indie scene that kind of came out of mumblecore, but isn't really mumblecore. Uh, and then, you know, made Lady Bird, that got some Oscar attention, so did Little Women. So now she's doing her big blowout blockbuster uh, attached to uh, a established IP. And I was, of course, kind of like, yeah, I'm not exactly going to go in expecting this to be up to the quality of Lady Bird and Little Women, just because, I mean, why would I? That's silly. Uh, it's like walking into whatever most recent comic book movie you're about to go see and expecting it to be the fucking Godfather. Like, come on, man, come off it. And I'm not saying that, you know, people are inherently going to expect that. I'm just saying I knew what I was getting into. And as a fun summer blockbuster movie, I was thoroughly pleased. I very much enjoyed this. Um, the production design and set work and like actual filmmaking is really, really impressive, honestly, especially that set work really leans into the kind of uncanny dollhouse sort of stage prop world of, of Barbie land. And it's, it's very charming. There's lots of great little visual gags that I, I very much appreciated. And while Greta's movies have been funny in the past, I wouldn't really classify them as, you know, mainline comedies, which this undoubtedly is, um, you know, and it plays things very broad, a lot, you know, a lot of the humor in particular is, you know, very safe. Um, but I don't really, again, see a problem with that just because, you know, I know this movie's audience. I'm not expecting it to cater to me. There is a, you know, underlying undercurrent of things like, you know, the patriarchy, talking about things like sexism, you know, stuff that you would imagine a Greta Gerwig Barbie movie to be about. And, you know, it's not exactly nuanced, but, you know, it's fun. The way that they play it is broad on purpose. And I feel like that just kind of adds to the humor. It's very on its face, kind of absurd with everything. It's kind of funny how... Like, it's a very magical realism kind of movie, but no one ever questions anything. And if they do, it's immediately dismissed uh, smartly, just because I feel like the movie would get way too caught up in itself. Uh, and it doesn't. It it does play things safely, but it's also touching. There are moments in the movie where you can distinctly tell, like, yeah, this isn't just a director for hire gig. Like, you can feel the Bombeck and the Gerwig touches in very select moments, but still feel, nonetheless quite honest and in a way that I it took me off guard but the real key of the movie here is again that it's a fun summer blockbuster it's very well made I think it's well written it's very well performed Gosling and Robbie are worth seeing the movie for even if you don't enjoy it I I think that particularly Gosling is having the time of his life uh this sort of turn that he's taken in the 2010s after movies like the nice guys where he's like both comedic inherently and also kind of a straight man really really works and this is just him dialed up to 11 i'm not even convinced that half of his lines were actually written it just kind of seems like he got so into character and just kind of went with it but yeah go see it with your you know smaller siblings go see it with you know its intended audience perhaps but as somebody who was not in any way the core target audience for party I enjoyed it very, very heavily. Um, there is a Jim Steinman musical number in it. It is amazing. Uh, loved it. A very good time at the movie films. Uh, I still need to see Oppenheimer. I will be rectifying that soon. Yeah, I'm proving for my, I'm proving for round two on Oppie, to be honest, at the moment as we speak. That's, I can't remember the last time I, ch like, I follow a good amount of people on Letterboxd. I have not seen a single person rate it under four stars. That never happens with the people I follow. Hell, especially not with Dolan. Like, usually his movies are a little bit more contentious with the, the cinephile crowd, but everybody's like, no, this is major. 
And that brings us to the end of this episode of Jams and Tea. Now, again, we'll be back very soon with the second half of our filmed conversation where we talk about underrated albums of 2013. So stick around for that. In the meantime, let us know what you think of any of the music that we talked about today. If you listen to the Owl City album, if you listen to any of the new songs when Big Thief, Code Orange, Gaslight Anthem, any of the stuff we've discussed today, if you have thoughts, let us know in the comments below and we'll see you again soon for another episode of Jams and Tea. But until then, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Barbie, you can be anything.